I'm going to take a moment because I believe expressing gratitude and thanksgiving is a godly thing. And I would be remiss not to thank you for the expressions of kindness and graciousness and the encouragement that you've given me from the invitation, first of all, to come here to the many kindnesses and especially the ones where I've botched your name and you, you haven't like taken a swipe at me because I should have known it. But I appreciate all of you and your kindnesses. I appreciate the elders and the invitation, but I especially appreciate my brother Antoine. Um, the years have been, the years have passed, but the fondness that I have for this man and my brother he means a lot, and I know that you have wrapped him up in your love and have shown respect to him and his work in ordaining him as a pastor here. And so, you know, hashtag that awkward moment is gone now because all the other times when they called him pastor, he wasn't. And now he is, and he can kind of lean into it. So that's a, that's a, that's a good thing. But thank you. The hospitality, the kindness... Please show everyone that, not just the loud mouth with the lapel mic. <laughs> show those kindnesses to each other. Show them to your neighbor. Show them to your enemies. Because then truly that will show that you are a disciple in an upside down kingdom. Christians are both exiles and pilgrims. If you've been here every night and afternoon and morning, you know where it's going. And you know at least at first what I'd like to say. We are citizens of a spiritual kingdom. And that's not something we need to run away from. It's something we need to lean into. Jesus certainly did. And as his servants, we are servant of the King of Kings who literally gave his life that we might live. That, this last song, he gave his life that we might live. Don't get tired of hearing that. Don't get tired of singing that. Because that's the foundational understanding of who we are and why we are who we are. We are who we are by the grace of God and because of His goodness and never cease expressing the kind of gratitude because once gratitude slips, Romans chapter 1 says, the sl not all slopes are slippery, but if we start becoming ungrateful, that slope slips into all manner of evil and sin and a place where we can see out in the world. The kingdom that we are a part of is not based on power and authority, even though there is power and authority. It's based on the grace and the love and the ideals and the selflessness of our king, who literally took as a crown a sign of the curse before he was crucified so that the curse could be lifted. I shared that with you on Thursday night, and I, I, I don't want it to, to leave your mind. That picture this morning that I put up of Jesus before we read Psalm 22, remember that because this kingdom is not based on the raw use and the consumption of people and power like earthly kingdoms. It's based on the selflessness of our God. When Jesus spoke here in his time on earth, he said things like, I know you've heard it one way in the past, but now let me tell you. Now, you know, to a good, zealous Jew... If it's true, it ain't new, and if it's new, it ain't true. You ever heard that one before? That's not right. Because if you've never heard the truth, it's going to be new. And when Jesus came, he spoke something new to his people. And he told them the truth like it should have always been taught. Because the, what the Jews were hearing at the time of Christ was not faithful to the law and the teachings of Moses and God. He came and explained the truth to them. That's why he could say, unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. Because you see, like Paul said, the Jews had created their own righteousness. They had created their own level. They had created their own way of doing things. And it was never pleasing to God. Because righteousness is not based on what we've done. Our righteousness is based on the faith that Jesus is the righteous one. When he says things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
And you know, there's the literal one in the crowd like, well, I have ears. Why can't I understand? It's because, McFly, it's not a hearing problem. That's a reference to Back to the Future. Some of you got it, some of you don't. But <laughs> Because we're all McFlies every once in a while, right? Sometimes things get in our way. Sometimes our heart gets in our way. Especially when he said the kingdom of heaven is like. You know, when, when he leaned into this one, that, that's when a disciple really needs to listen. When he says the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet, we're like, wait a second, oh, what? what's a dragnet? We need to listen and try to understand. And here's the kicker. Anytime he said, do not be afraid, you know why he said that? Because there was something to be afraid of. I remember when our boys were little and there was a thunderstorm that came through and it was rattling the old windows in the house we lived in right then and they were scared to death. And no matter how many times Cindy or I patted their head and say, don't be afraid. You think that worked? Because <clears throat> there's something to be afraid of. And it takes a mature, loyal disciple to have something that's fearful all around and to have the faith of an Elisha, knowing that there's someone on our side that's greater than the fear factor. But Jesus says, do not be afraid. But let's be honest, there's some scary things that happen in life. And they're used against us. Because when we are truly fearful, we don't always act with the best of our wisdom and the best of our knowledge. And the best of our faith. All of these and others are keys to opening up our mind and our hearts to the teaching of Jesus. I ask you to open with me in Matthew chapter 5 because I think in starting in Jesus' personal ministry, we get to the realities of a life lived in an upside down kingdom. There are certain realities that we need to face as disciples of Christ. Jesus didn't hide the cost of discipleship from his followers. Jesus didn't try to put a nice little bow on things, to try to condense things down so much until it lost all meaning. Sometimes in religion, people do things like this. They try to sell. There isn't a sense as ambassadors of Christ and as gospel people, we try to offer the grace of God. But it's not about salesmanship. It's about the truth. When it comes more about the preacher or the person rather than the truth, then you get a false religion which is why living amongst folks like you who are so encouraging is a pretty heady place. But I've been preaching long enough not to read my press clippings. It's a very important thing to be grounded in your faith. Not so high, not so low, not to be afraid, not to be proud, but to be faithful. And the realities, of, the realities of life are there are peaks and valleys. There are troubles. There are enemies. There is joy. But let's talk about this reality of life as we read the Sermon on the Mount. Not all of it. Just the first few verses of Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus teaches, here is almost the beginning of his public ministry, and he comes right out of the, right out of the box saying, it's upside down. He comes right out of the box saying it. And I'd like to talk with you for a moment about dissonance. 
If you're a music nerd, you know that a first, first, third, and fifth chord is a major chord. And you're also, if you're a music nerd and you know that you add a seventh to it, there is a, a dissonance. A, a first, third, and fifth chord is the chord that almost all gospel songs end on, where there is this wholeness, and it's beautiful, and it's clean. And then you sing songs like, There is a Green Hill, and you're like, ooh, there's, there's something about that song. Well, the song is written, first of all, it's written in a minor key. I know I'm going way down the music rabbit hole for some of you, and you're like, wait, wait, this isn't music class. Keith's back there going, yeah, baby. <laughs> But in music, there's a dissonance, and then in most gospel songs, there's a resolution where it, it adds something to a major chord, and it, you can almost feel the angst in it. And then there's a resolution at the end. It's almost like, oh, the sun's coming up. In almost every song we sang tonight, there were chords of dissonance where it doesn't seem to... And then there's the resolution. Jesus teaches us from the earliest part of his ministry that what we think is normal and what the earth thinks is normal in our lives, what we're prone to want and what we're prone to seek as normal human beings is not valued in the kingdom. Even in this passage, even in the Beatitudes, the very definition of dissonance as disciples in the kingdom is talked about. No one values mourning. Nobody likes to go to a funeral home. Now, I know you, you disciple nerds. I know you know the, the passage in Ecclesiastes. We ain't getting there yet. Nobody wants to go to a funeral home. But Jesus starts right off and says, Blessed are those happy, rejoicing are those of you who mourn. And he just leans right in. He doesn't try to hide it. He, you know, you know the, the fine print on all the contracts or when on the radio commercial, the TV commercial, the guys blah, 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 at the end, you know what they're trying to do? They have to say it, but they're saying it so fast that you don't hear it. Jesus doesn't hide any of his dissonance. He starts with it right off the bat. The world does not value Humility. In fact, the world takes humble people and walks all over them. The world doesn't value self-sacrifice. The world certainly doesn't value persecution, but he says, blessed are you when you are persecuted in verse 10. Blessed are you, verse 11, when they revile and persecute you. What is he, what is he telling you right off the bat? He's telling you and me right off the bat, if we're going to be disciples, there are going to be times that there is going to be a dissonance in our mind and in our life, and it's not bad. Don't look for the fleshly resolution. Look for the spiritual one. In fact, verse 12, if you'll pardon the expression for those of you who are old enough to remember the gong show, he hits the gong in verse 12, where after all this dissonance, he says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Well, you know what I'm about to do. I'm about to call the timeout by the coach. Let's roll the clock. How are you supposed to rejoice in persecution? You're not going to do it except by the strength of God. You're not going to be able to bull your way through it. You're not going to be able by the force of your personality to charge through it. Your physical strength and vitality is not going to cause you to rejoice in persecution. How Paul and Silas were singing and praising God in the midst of the dungeon in Philippi. Well, as Christians, we might come to accept it as rare, as odd. So odd that the jailer runs in and says, I got to have me some of what y'all got. But you see what Christians do. We have to lean into this dissonance. But I'm afraid what happens, because we come to church, and because we study it, and because we read it, I'm afraid we vaccinate ourselves against the dissonance. There were arguments over vaccinations, and I'm not going to try to get into all of, all of that argument. But you know what vaccinations are, right? 
where you get a little bit, you get a little bit of it until you get immune to it, right? Well, brothers and sisters, what I'm afraid the 21st century American Christians are tempted to do is get a, just enough Jesus to get us vaccinated against him in some of this dissonance. And we lessen and we weaken some of the more powerful words of Jesus and his apostles, and we lower the bar to make it more palatable, to make it easier, to say things like, well, all you need to do is be baptized. Excuse me? We know what we want. We want more numbers. We want more people. We want to feel good about ourselves. So let's not read verse 12. Let's talk about, he came to get that we may have an abundant life. Let's read John 10, 10. Let's not read the passages that are challenging. Let's not study the things that are challenging. Let's kind of dumb it down. Because what we should expect is easy, constant growth. Growth should come. It should be easy. There shouldn't be a whole lot of cost to it. Because that's what American religion teaches us. After all, all you do to grow a church is apply a good business model to it, right, elders? He said with his tongue firmly planted in his cheek. You can't be a part of a spiritual kingdom and the leadership of a spiritual kingdom and expect to use fleshly methods to do it. If elders fall into the temptation of reading the book, Who Moved My Cheese, and apply it to the church, wrong! And if you don't know who stole my cheese or moved my cheese, just please just don't go read it, because... <laughs> Because I didn't either. <laughs> I just thought the title was funny. <laughs> Expectations of a life in Christ that are all positive and wonderful and syrupy sweet and happy and clappy. Does that sound like the Beatitudes that we just read here? All you need for your family to get is to get back right and get yourselves to church. Well, while there might be part of that that's true, there's so much more to being a disciple than showing up at the building at the right time. I appreciate the need to sometimes to condense an idea, but I'm afraid we may have condensed the dissonance right out of the spiritual lives to make it more palatable, to make it more comfortable, to make it more acceptable because church growth says you go out there and you ask them what they want and then you give them what they want and then you can grow a church Jesus says preach the truth whether they like it or whether they don't like it 2 Timothy 4 verses 3 and 4 We should not make the mistake of being true to our desires and our feelings so much that we dismiss the truth and the challenges of being a disciple. The realities of life in an upside-down kingdom is that there's going to be dissonance, and we don't need to run away from it. We need to lean into it until the dissonance becomes a part of our musical and spiritual vocabulary, if you will. Because there is dissonance all over the first 10 verses here of the Beatitudes, we can expect more. Another example is a few, a few bars later, if you will, when Jesus talked about adultery. You've heard you should not commit adultery. I say, don't look at somebody. Now, you know, you know, you know what some men have done? You know what some preachers have done? Preachers have looked at women and said, it's your fault that men are committing adultery. I mean, can you look at this verse and hear any of that? No. It's a bunch of men trying to pat them to say, oh, well, it's not our fault. It's the women's fault. That's a bunch of hogwash. It's never the fault of someone else if I commit a sin. Now, could she be inappropriately dressed? Well, sure she could. But get over it, buttercup. It's time to toughen up and be a disciple of Christ. 
I don't know if you ever heard that before, but there you go. Like I said, I grew up when, you know, in the women liver thing, when the, you know, strong women were the bane of, of, of an existence. And I'm like, it ain't the women's fault. The reason the women livers happened is because men weren't the kind of men they should have been for millennia. Ooh, even got some, got some female amens on that one. <laughs> Give that one an Oprah snap there, I guess. Uh, But in all of this, brothers and sisters and friends, it's going to be hard work because we're going against the grain. You ever watch any of those Nat Geo channels where they talk about the salmon and how they're swimming upstream? That's what we're doing all our lives. We are swimming upstream. We're going against the current because we can't get out of the current. God didn't say get out of the current. He says stay in the current but be strong because we have an adversary who's doing anything that he can to get us to cave in, to quit, to give up, to try an alternate route, to try to do anything other than what our Lord said to do. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, this is not a preacher finally, this is an actual finally, finally. In Philippians chapter or in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, and put on the whole armor of God, and that you be able to withstand against the schemings of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, what's he saying? He's saying you're fighting against somebody that ain't going to play fair, and he's going to try to do anything in the world that he can do to try to get you to quit, to fail, to blame somebody else, and to just give up because it's hard. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. My Father has always kept his promises. I will always keep mine, and I will always be with you. Now that preach is smooth and easy. But what happens when you're Elijah? What happens when you feel like there ain't nobody else? Because those moments are real. That's a reality of life. When you can't explain everything away. It's hard work. And I don't want to be the guy to be blamed for not telling the truth about the reality of life. We face an adversary who will use any sort of opening. If he knows we have an Achilles heel, if he knows that we have a weakness, he doesn't know all things, but he knows humans. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, as Paul was talking to this group of Christians, in 2 Corinthians... Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 12, he says, But what I do, I will continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into a messenger of light. You see, English translators didn't actually translate the word angel. They took the Greek word and made it into an English word. Angel means messenger. He's a messenger of light. And he knows that we are easily weak and easily deceived. And in moments of struggle, we can be tempted to turn our back. In the realities of life, hear what Isaiah said about our Lord. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I told you, I believe it was last night, about my son's mother-in-law who died after, her, she died 10 days after contracting COVID. I have friends and, a, and brothers and sisters who don't believe that COVID was real. And they started becoming evangelists of that. Well, my wife, in her sorrow and grief, just went up to them one time and says, you know, you can think what you want until you have to bury somebody your age and watch your daughter-in-law and son cry. Don't be evangelizing stuff you don't know anything about. 
because life is full of things that are hard to explain and difficult to get through without the faith of God. I know why people turn to liquor. It's not to party. It's to quiet and dumb down their mind because they're hurting and they're, they're in pain and they're looking for something to ease the pain and to quiet their mind because life is hard and there are griefs and there are sorrows. And we have a God who says, your king went through just that for you. Where is a king like that? Because in the world, don't show them your weakness. Don't show them your vulnerability. Certainly don't be transparent with them because they'll use it against you. What does our God do? He opens it up completely and says, not only is it real, not only does it hurt, I'm going to take it. That's a God to worship who makes it possible for us to get through the sorrow and the grief. The struggle and the pain of discipleship and the sacrifice are real. And he talks about it. And he says, count the cost. He doesn't say, oh, it won't be that much. Like they're selling you a Toyota. You can afford it. I don't know if any of y'all buy. I, don't, so I, I apologize if you're a Toyota. You got to say that these days and cover your bases. The struggle and pain of discipleship and sacrifice are real. And any real change in mind and body and soul and spirit and heart requires difficult work. I watched my mom, and I remember her struggle raising us being divorced in the late 60s and early 70s when the times were not so kind to the divorcee. And I think back to the depression I think she, she had in being isolated and being alone, but who worked through it and in her spirituality and in her struggles and in her foibles and in her failures, she always told us to trust in the Lord. And that's what I remember, not the problems that she had. You know, we, we can count each other's problems, but I saw her tears. And I know, I know in some sense now as an adult, thinking back how hard, I, you know, there are times that I look at Cindy when, when, when I've been gone and I go back and I said, how did you survive this? If you've got teenagers and you're all by yourself, bless your heart. Because being a single parent is difficult. It was difficult then. I can't imagine how difficult it is now. But there would be a real grief and a real sorrow to be going through something like that without help. When Jesus talked of the, the scope of discipleship and the cost of it, he wasn't bashful. We've read this earlier and we're going to read it again because it's too important not to read again. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 57, it happened as they journeyed on the road, someone said to him, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And then Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who were at my house. And Jesus says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So please, as a disciple of Christ, when you were talking to someone else about becoming a disciple of Christ, do not paint a rosier picture than our Lord did. There are joys in being forgiven and the grace of God are real and palpable, but don't sell them a bill that you can't pay. Local churches like this, what we talked about this morning, local churches like this are built for the joy and the fellowship and the praise and the worship of God and the fellowship that we can have with one another. But the real hard things of life is where churches can grow. And don't hide from that. Confess your faults one to another, like our brother did today. He said, I need prayers. And you prayed for him. We need to be more open and transparent like that with each other. We don't need to tell all of the gory details. We don't need to know details. But sometimes we need to know 
the grief and the sorrow of real life that we have family that we can turn to. What do you suppose is out there? What's out there for real? Nothing is satisfying. It's what can be had in the kingdom of God. Because what's going to happen in the kingdom of God... Whoops, too fast. What's going to happen in the kingdom of God is there are going to be Judas and Demas moments. There are going to be Judases in our life where they aren't who they thought they were. And Demas, when Paul says, and Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. There are going to be, there are going to be times like this. There are going to be Diotrephes moments. You know Diotrephes in 3 John where he loved to have the preeminence and he helped basically ruin a church? There are going to be times like that. And what is called for is strength and resolve and discipleship. Not a power play. But sometimes you need to speak the truth to power. Because you know what Diotrephes was all about? He's about that power. He's about that authority. He even challenged John in his apostleship. And somebody needed to stand up and stand in the gap and say something in love but with truth to condemn that action. And I wonder if anybody was there. In Acts chapter 15, a passage that I don't think we talk about too much with brethren. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas came to a head on a judgment issue. A judgment issue over a person. And what Paul and Barnabas did was decide to part ways. Kind of like Abram and Lot. You go one way, I'll go the other. And I wonder if we'd been around if we'd chosen sides. Well, I believe Paul. Well, I believe Barnabas. Well, we'll have the Paulites over here and we'll have the Barnabites over here. I kind of came up with that Barnabite one right there. I don't know if it's any good or not. <laughs> but isn't that what Americans would do? They would choose sides. Instead of just letting each other go on and do the work of God. How disappointing that would be. Or even Matthew chapter 10 when he says, Your enemies will be those of your own household. Think about that grief and sorrow. Listen. If you've had children who've turned away from the Lord, you know real sorrow and grief. And I feel for you, having experienced myself. You come to understand when, G when Jesus cried over Jerusalem. Because there's some things even our Lord couldn't do. How I wanted to gather you up as a hen gathered her chicks, but you were not willing. You see, what you see in those pictures, you don't see the tears for an unfaithful son. But there is joy even in the midst of sorrow. Because, Dan, what I wanted to do on Wednesday night, and I knew I was going to get into this tonight, so I didn't. He was talking about joy on Wednesday night in Bible class. Jesus told his disciples, I want to give you my joy. But he was also a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So which is it? Yes. It's yes. Because it's real. There's not just one or not just the other. There's the yes. But even in the yes, there is joy. Even in the midst of great sorrow, there is joy. This old lady, this old lady was dying of cancer. And as a young preacher, I was going out to visit her. And I, wanted to, I went up to her and I said, Miss Lucille, I'm so sorry. She looked at me and she sounded just like my grandmother. She looked at me, she says, Mark Russell, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, oh, man, she, somebody, somebody, my mother must have told her. Anytime my mother said Mark Russell, I'm like, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Y'all laughing because it happened to you too. 
And she looked at me, she says, what's wrong with you? She says, I've been living my life, my whole life, up to this point where I get to go home. So in the midst of cancer ravaging her body, what was she looking forward to? The smile of the father welcoming her home. That's why we can smile in even when we are racked with pain and sorrow, even in the midst of the most awful. But what you see on Instagram is not concerns about parents or cancer or money or children or sleeplessness or worry. The good news about the good news is not that it's cheap and easy, but that it's worth it. The good news about the good news is the value that our God has placed on us. The good news about the good news is the value that we get to understand about everybody else. Think about how important this world, how, how much better this world would be if everybody knew that the value of the person that they're being tempted to condemn or hurt or cut off or dismiss was valuable to the Lord. And how much different as disciples our light and salt can be when we value folks who, by and large, in the world would be our enemies. In the world would be different. In the world we wouldn't even know each other. Without Jesus, I wouldn't know any of you. And I would be the lesser because of it. Because I know the value of the gospel. And it's not only in the saving of our souls, but in the value of every soul. Every soul is valuable to God. That's why we are told to rejoice with each other. Let love be genuine. That's what the Holy Spirit said through Paul to the Romans. Genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Here you go. You want a competition? You want to keep track? Outdo one another in being godly and loving and compassionate and serving one another. No, don't keep track. But did you hear what Paul said? Instead of keeping track of how everybody else has failed you, keep track of how you're doing and trying to outdo your brother in love and hospitality and kindness. Verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Boy, have we not needed that the last couple of years. Did y'all get antsy during COVID? Did y'all get on edge? Even in the house. Cindy and me. I mean, we've both been doing our jobs for over 30 years, and in the snap of a finger, we're trying to do them different. And he says, be patient with each other. Be constant in prayer. Continue, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Did you hear it? He doesn't run away from it. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. Why? Because there is joy even in the midst of deep sorrow in an upside down kingdom. Because in this upside down kingdom, there's an answer to the problems of life. Peace and hope and joy through faith. Our faith grants us an ease of concern because we believe in the sovereignty of God. We may not be able to explain everything and we'd probably be better off if we admitted such. We don't understand all the workings of God. Nobody ever has. And anybody who has ever tried, Job's friends, have got it wrong. It's better to live in the peace and the hope and the joy of the Lord than try to find joy through medicines, through liquor, through intimacy that's not biblical, 
There's a lot, there's a lot of this world offering us comfort and joy that's antithetical to a disciple being in the kingdom. But what a disciple does, he says, my Lord has set up a boundary. That's the yoke of Matthew chapter 11. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. There is a boundary that he's given us to live in. And within this boundary, there is joy in the midst of the sorrows and the grief of living because we've been adopted into the family of God. Our faith teaches us in hope to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I could start another series with this comment, but I ain't going to because I believe in the golden rule. Not everything that happens on this earth is God's prescribed will. Some of the things that happen on this earth is the devil's will. So don't be going around saying, oh, it must be God's will. Some of it ain't. That's why we pray, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And until that day, until that day when it is done, we need to remember this one last thing. This one last thing, and then the lesson is yours. We are victors in Christ. You know, you know where I'm going. Romans chapter 8. Please open up with me. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And you know what that literal one in, in Bible class will say? Well, I know some people that are against us. That's not what he's saying, y'all. He's not saying there ain't no one against us. He says they don't stack up compared to who's on our side. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to the slaughter. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now please, brothers and sisters, I'm begging you, don't end that with saying, but we can separate ourselves. That's not the point. The point is, we serve a God who is powerful and has won the victory for us through Jesus Christ. And in giving us Jesus Christ, He has given us a victorious mindset that we don't have to look for the loopholes and say, well, I can separate. Disciples don't think that way. We don't think about, well, I could or I might or I might have. In faith, we trust the grace and the forgiveness of God that if we have been baptized in Him and we have prayed and confessed our love for Him, that He has cleansed us freely of all the things that should have separated us from Him. That's why we have confidence. Not in ourselves, not in our perfection, not in all the people we've baptized, not in all the teaching we've done. We have confidence in the one who says, You are my son. You are my daughter. I love you. How long did it take you to trust that out of your beloved? I mean, really trust it. It took a while, didn't it? It took a while to really understand what love actually means between husband and wife. And really, it's a lifelong thing. But the way of victory, we've already read it before. The way of victory is in Romans chapter 12. It's by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, and we do not love our lives to the death. Brothers and sisters, I hope these six lessons have done, first of all, what the elders wanted. 
But I don't want you to just put up with this upside down nature. That, it's, it's not something, well, I guess I have to put up with my neighbor. That's no way to be a good neighbor. We don't just put up with it because it is our relationship with God. We thrive in this victorious mindset. As the, as the grace-bought people of God, this is who we are. This isn't just some alternate thought process. This is the process of being a disciple and servant of the God of heaven. And until we adopt this way of life in faith, our purpose and our destination is going to be skewed. God doesn't want it to be skewed. He wants it to be clear. To be clear that in serving Him, there's no better way of living. There's no better people to be around because you're around people who understand the value that their God has placed on them and you and everyone else. And we can go on living our life in the abundant joy and the peace and the hope of the glory of God that one day we'll see His face. But the only way any of that worked, the only way any of this worked, and it was the eternal purpose that He accomplished. This, 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 it wasn't some mistake. Jesus' death wasn't some mistake. It's always been the way. The only way that it worked was when Jesus allowed death and evil to overpower him, it seemed. There ain't no grave could have hold him down. There's an old bluegrass song that I was just introduced to not long ago. And the chorus says something like this. In awe and wonder, he said, You made the man who put the nail in your hand. You even made the tree. And I was just like, Now think about that for a minute. As the creator of heaven and earth, Jesus created the man who nailed him to the tree. He even created the tree and knew about it. And you know why? You know why he let it happen? That's how much he loves us. That's the kind of love that should stimulate and motivate us to adopt his way of living to his honor and glory because he deserves it. So it's not too much for him to ask us to be baptized. It's not too much for him to ask us to repent. It's not too much for ask, to ask us to sacrifice because he's done all of that in front of us. So tonight, the gospel asks the question. If he is not your king, he needs to be, and you need to bow before him. Because you know what you'll find before you bow before him? Him bowing before you, ready to wash your feet. That's a savior to worship. That's a lord and king to serve. Serve him. And if you need to